Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. We are all uh, participating, most of us are, are participating in two forms, once in the conference and also in helping uh, Bucerius launch this wonderful new initiative that they have, for which that they are doing, for which we have high expectations and, and we're very much committed to. Uh, I think it's a, a really great idea and has a lot of potential, so we hope it gets there. I'm talk my talk today is uh, based on a very long article, uh, When Copyright Law and Science Collide with Ruk Okidiji. Uh, this will appear in uh, 96 University of Minnesota Law Review, in theory, any day, but they've been saying that for several weeks, and we still haven't got page proofs, but uh, it is the next issue. Uh, and it, uh, uh, what I'm giving you today is a, a brief condensation, a 30-minute condensation of a very long article. So let's start with the proposition that Dana mentioned. Information technology today is uh, transforming uh, fields as diverse as molecular biology, especially genomics and proteomics, and conservation ecology, which gives you your GPS system, and it's spawning whole new fields, metagenomics, uh, metabolomics. Why? Well, the combination of massive storage capacity, powerful data manipulation techniques, and graphical capabilities has revolutionized both how basic research is conducted and how the resulting knowledge is preserved and disseminated in nearly all fields of science. And something else these methodologies have done is they generate networked communities of users and collaborators. Often these communities work in dynamic knowledge hubs. Uh, they have interactive communications uh, that steer uh, computational applications in potentially more fruitful directions, working together, and they fill virtual repositories with enormous amounts of data and information that are very difficult to manage. In this promising new research environment, Scientists increasingly rely on automated knowledge discovery tools to mine and recombine vast amounts of data and literature that are flowing at rates that exceed the capacity of single investigators to comprehend, hence the constant pooling of uh, resources. Um, and they have to... Uh, uh, exploit these new opportunities, uh, in order to exploit these new opportunities, they have to integrate information and data scattered over an enormously broad range of articles and databases that may or may not be available online. Well, to make full use of these tools, <laughs> Uh, these automated knowledge discovery tools, scientists need unrestricted access to a broad range of journals and databases, and they need unrestricted rights to extract, use, and reuse the published research results they contain for purposes of future research. Uh, the convergence of computerized technologies and telecommunications networks has now made this pooling uh, uh, capacity feasible at just the right time when the data and literature is exploding. Uh, and the norms of science favor this pooling and sharing. So what stands in the way? Well, that's why I'm here. Uh, uh, <laughs> what stands in the way is intellectual property laws as currently configured. And why is that? Well, in the 1990s, because uh, the entertainment industry was worried about the possible real losses they could sustain, um, uh, 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 they put a lot of pressure on various legislatures, so we had an unprecedented extension of copyright law and related rights protecting both literature and uh, collections of data into the realm of basic science uh, with no adequate exceptions for research uh, as such. So the science publishers were riding the tail of the entertainment community. Now, in our view, uh, my co-author and I, copyright and database uh, protection laws impede access to data and literature. This risk and these costs, uh, they pose a much greater and more immediate obstacle to upstream scientific research than gene patents and the related issues that have been attracting all the attention. Uh, while everybody's talking about gene patents, what's going on in this area is far more serious. Now, let us see how, let us see how this situation came about very briefly. We, we condense uh, 50 pages in five minutes, but you will get the point very quickly. This is some of the table of contents. <laughs> this is some of the table of contents of uh, uh, the article. So let's just take a look at this law. Here is the Information Society Directive. 
uh, of 2000 or 2001, which, which many people in this audience, I'm sure, welcomed as a relief from the overly restrictive laws of national, in their national laws. Okay, so this was supposed to do wonderful things. So what does it do for science? First of all, we get this narrow and ambiguous exception for science, used for the sole purpose of illustration for teaching or scientific research, or <laughs> used for the sole purpose of illustration for teaching, or scientific research. What does this mean? I'm sure the publishers are willing to tell you what it means. It means use for illustration, anything, period. No more. Don't even think about doing anything else with it. So this is, uh, and then non-commercial scientific research. What is non-commercial scientific research? According to the uh, uh, United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, no patent research at any university is uh, anything but commercial. So you tell me where we draw the line. Okay. Uh, uh, then, what did because national laws were even more restrictive, what did scientists really rely on traditionally? They relied on the private use exception. <laughs> okay, so what did the commission do with private use exception on which science historically relied? It put a fair compensation requirement on there. Okay, well now the publishers will tell you owe us for everything, right? They <laughs> okay, and now <laughs> that isn't the end of the story because they took both the private use exception and the science exception and they subjected it to the three-step test of Article 13 of the TRIPS agreement, saying we were obliged to do this, which was completely false, okay? Especially after the WIPO Copyright Treaty, which we put in there, uh, Article 10, is specifically to enable fair use in the United States. They, they, they ignored that, okay? So all of these means that you have to have the three-step test. It must be applied in certain special cases, which do not conflict with the normal exploitation of the word, and do not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the rights holder. And of course, most courts in Europe will say, and all three steps must give a yes answer, or you don't have it. So if this sounds like digital science to you, we're in the wrong room. OK. So, but this isn't the end of the story. Because then, the directive allows scientific publishers to surround literature and data transmitted online with electronic fences, digital locks. Now, what does that mean? Okay, it means you cannot go in through the side door. You cannot make a hole and take out uh, the data or the scientific findings. You have to go into the electronic gateway. And at the electronic gateway, you will be met with an electronic contract of adhesion. That's lawyer's terms for a one-sided, non-negotiable contract, which will take away any exception, any rights that you had in copyright law as a price of entering. And if you do not agree, you do not enter, try taking money out of your bank account without saying yes to the $2 fee. And if you agree, you will waive your fair use rights in the United States or your exception here. So this is a perfect system. But is it done? No, because the EU directive on the legal protection of database will then give potentially longer and stronger protection to non-copyrightable collections of data than to copyrightable scientific literature. Don't get me started on this theme. Uh, fortunately, we avoided it in the United States. So this legal framework portrays a set of rules and policies that are diametrically opposed to the needs of science and researchers in a university of discourse where automated knowledge discovery tools must freely explore the range of thematically relevant digitally distributed literature and data. What is worse than not including the data that might turn out to be the essential data? The, the, the Hargraves review conducted recently for the United Kingdom government brought to light a couple of uh, uh, beautiful examples. Uh, consider, for example, that the Wellcome Trust found that 87% uh, of the material in the United Kingdom's main medical research database, the UK PubMed Central, was unavailable for legal text, uh, uh, for, for legal text and data mining. Not available. PubMed Central. Uh, by the same token, Hargraves found that uh, uh, there's a, a collection of uh, 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 1,000 journal articles from the first half of the 20th century that described malaria in indigenous peoples and soldiers, as well as details of therapeutic measures that were available at that time, kind of historical record of uh, uh, t traditional knowledge, ways of dealing with this problem, but that they were unavailable. Uh, virtually impossible to text mine because of rights clearing requirements that appear out of all proportion to any benefit the rights holders could want 
even if they could be found, orphan works problem, <laughs> Uh, researchers cannot uh, digitally index or text mine sources that offer p uh, potentially significant insights into the treatment of malaria. Now, okay, you will notice what is missing here is something I said this morning. You have no provision for fair use to soften these uh, designated exceptions uh, in uh, uh, European law. You have only this very tough version of the three-step test. Now, in our law, as I hinted this morning, on the whole, when we're thinking about traditional scientific research, um, our fair use uh, provision, uh, that was Article 13 of TRIPS, the three-step test, sorry. Mm -hmm. What did I do? Uh, I'm, I'm hooked, I, I'm hooked, to, are we all? okay. Um, uh, our fair use provision does a better job uh, dealing with uh, fair use on a case-by-case -case basis as it historically arose uh, in, in the United States. We have four tests. Uh, they're quite rational, but they are not all to be answered. Yes, the court has to weigh these tests and come up with an overall evaluation, much as the Max Planck uh, Institute urged people to do with the, the three-step test. Then you come to an overall uh, normative evaluation. But I have to tell you, that the, uh, the, the 107 fair use exception, it isn't going to solve the problem of uh, uh, mass digital uh, text mining and uh, digital research any much better than your designated exception approach. Uh, because why? <laughs> because the systematic need that researchers as users of automated knowledge discovery tools have to survey vast indeed unlimited amounts of literature and data in <laughs> virtually every a large scale investigation, in, especially in the life science, it just overwhelms the boundaries set by these four very flexible, very reasonable, it just overwhelms them. Consider, for example, the implicit purpose of the substantiality test in three the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. Okay, that sounds reasonable, but not even in parity can you systematically, every case, take the whole, use the whole, and then put it back and say, okay, that was a fair use. You're, 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 you're you're, you're scanning the whole, the whole work here. Uh, you can't really uh, interpret this provision uh, to make that uh, uh, flexible enough because every scientific investigation is routinely going to look at the whole of uh, reproduce every relevant article and uh, data collection. And then look at the market harm test. This is, I keep hitting this and I don't want to hit it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I write about technology, but as you can see, I never use it. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, the market, the market uh, harm test, if you take that market harm test seriously, it's, dream, it's drained of any meaning whatsoever if we have to take into account the commercial interests of publishers and not just the research interests of, of scientists. Now, let me show you a very interesting example of that. This is... Professor Matthew Sags, uh, this is some uh, uh, notes taken from a very brilliant uh, article by uh, Professor Matthew Sag, who has tried to explain why the search engine cases uh, in, in all the appellate courts have so far turned out to be fair uses, which, which is a wonderful tribute to our fair use. And he tries to put a, a doctrinal hook uh, uh, to uh, reconcile them. Uh, the rationale is these are transformative uses, okay? They add something uh, that we didn't have before without necessarily taking any uh, very much away from a public good, which uh, without taking very much away from the uh, author. And, and he, he, he refines it more. He says, look, non-expressive, because Google's engine is not expressing anything, non-expressive, non-substitutional, it's not substituting, it's promoting the work that it's giving you a little snippet from, in conjunction with copy-reliant technologies, should normally qualify as fair uses across the board. And then, I added this last part, uh, 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 he doesn't say it directly there, he's, when he's talking about the Google, uh, uh, the Google uh, book problem, he says, especially in that large, uh, that kind of a situation, you can have an opt-in, and if people opt-in, then they have nothing to complain about. Now, uh, 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 let us look at this for a moment. Uh, uh, and let us suppose that we have uh, even a more permissive clause here. Let us have an opt-out condition rather than an opt-in. You're in uh, rather than you're out. Now, um, <laughs> one, if we apply this to scientific research, 
we have to, we are immediately confronted with the possibility that from the rights holder's perspective, massive copying of published research articles to generate further research by means of automated knowledge discovery tools arguably represents both a substitutional use, because he's selling scientific research, and an expressive use of those articles, uh, which is not going to happen in the ordinary search engine context. Uh, now, of course, that's exactly what scientists want, right? Please use my article. Scientists, as, uh, as authors, want you to take my article, use it for further research. But we cannot envision, even though uh, our fair use law is normally a gratis use, we cannot envision a, a gratis fair use on this scale if uh, we are taking the aims of commercial science publishers seriously. It just doesn't fit. Now, if we move publishers out of the picture for a moment, we look only at uh, scientists as researchers, as both creators and users of their own published outputs, then uh, uh, SAG's uh, uh, default formula for fair use here uh, in regard to copyright reliant technologies, that could really improve the research community's technical legal position. Uh, yeah, you're using this thing, we're using it for, it's non-substitutional, uh, uh, and, and if we add an opt-out condition, uh, it's even greater. Why? Think about it. What happens to the scientist who puts up his hand and says, I want out? He will be clobbered. His peer scientists will start writing him nasty letters. The NIH will say, National Institutes of Health will say, please do not apply here. And the NSF will send him a, 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 a very, very nasty email uh, saying, what about the grant we gave you last time? So it isn't possible for a scientist to opt out of such a situation. Uh, if instead scientists constitute the market for published scientific research. And if that published research cannot be freely and digitally perused without impermissible market harm to publishers, then automated research tools risk becoming instruments of massive and systematic infringement, like your peer review, uh, your peer uh, file sharing of uh, musical works. No transformative use doctrine can excuse that massive kind of use if publishers' customary interests are to be preserved. Uh, notice, by the way, that if fair uses were to survive this analysis, they would still be wiped out uh, if the, uh, the scientific literature or data is transmitted online. Why? Well, because Digital Millennium Copyright Act says, yes, you get fair use, but only if you have lawful access. To get lawful access, you have to go through the electronic doorway. There you will meet the electronic contract, which says, yes, you cannot enter with fair use. We do not recognize fair use in this chamber, and that has been upheld by our federal appellate courts. Many of us wonder how and why that could be, and will the Supreme Court arise one day and, and, and turn that on its face? But that is the situation. Uh, and then, uh, remember that fair use in the United States, even when available, uh, despite what some of my colleagues uh, think or don't think about, it's not immune to the three-step test of the TRIPS Agreement and the WIPO Copyright Treaty when foreign <laughs> works are at stake. On the contrary, okay? <laughs> On the contrary, we sign, we are obliged to recognize the three-step tip. Okay, so if we take a step back from this uh, uh, concoction, what do we see? Wittingly or unwittingly, these laws force scientific researchers to choose between ignoring an unmanageable and unreasonable set of legal constraints in the interest of pursuing science as a public good, or they have to forego research opportunities uh, in order to avoid thickets of rights, burdensome transaction costs, and the fear of lawsuits down, uh, down the end. This puts the public in a no-win situation because without science, we don't get innovation. <laughs> and that is not a good thing in today's world. So, okay, you say, let's fix the situation. Okay, try to envision a legislative fix of this incredibly science-hostile regime. You, it would have to be much more radical than any mere incremental fix here. You, you would need a broad, tailor-made exemption for scientific research as such, as the Max Planck Angst, uh, Institute itself realized in responding to the Green Paper that the Commission put forward about, well, 
how is science faring under our copyright law? And of course, <laughs> the answers that came back were not, <laughs> were not what they wanted to hear. And the Max Planck Institute said, you have to have a broad, <laughs> uh, uh, broad exemption for science. It has to allow use and reuse of published research materials for virtually any scientific purpose. Uh, and it has to legitimize storage, archiving, data extraction, and the like. And, and we certainly uh, uh, agree with that. And, and we even would, would say you have to go farther. Any article made public of available online has to be available for data mining procedures and data manipulation by automated knowledge discovery tools, including virtual scientific experimentation without any constraint other than what? Attribution under the norms of uh, science. And then that exemption uh, must apply uh, to uh, all of this other stuff that's out there, gray literature that's, uh, that's online, articles that are not peer reviewed and so on. And, uh, 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 and it has to be available everywhere in the world, which is unthinkable. And then you would have to have complementary legislation to forbid publishers from using technical protection measures, digital locks, to override that broad exemption. And then you would have to, uh, 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 you have to prohibit two things. You would have to prohibit te technical protection measures from doing it, and you would have to prohibit contractual overrides, period. Otherwise, the publisher chooses what parts of copyright law he or she wants and, 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 and not the ones that the public wants, and then you would have to have complementary legislation uh, allowing access to uh, databases protected under the database laws of 55 countries. Well, if, 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 if you think that, uh, and then uh, let me just add one more thing, you, then you need also, uh, you won't get away from it, you will have to have a much more flexible approach to the three-step test or you still can't get away with it. Uh, the Max Planck Institute has put out a, a wonderfully, deeply considered proposal for the three-step test. Martin Senflin has written on this also very well. Uh, so this is what you would all need. Uh, what are the prospects for legislation on this order at the moment? I mean, it's impossible. You heard people saying the commission, everything uh, this morning, everything the commission puts out says we need stronger and higher rights because that will do more for us while they sink the research ship <laughs> in the water. I mean, it just makes no sense. Uh, as Hargrave says, uh, the Hargrave reports, I didn't say it, Hargrave's report says this is not economics, this is lobbyonomics. Uh, Where is the evidence to support this view that higher protection is more uh, innovation? So, under this, in that kind of a situation, uh, uh, we're not going to get a legislative fix, and science is, is roaring on, which makes the scientific community potentially massive infringers like your, your file share musical people. So, uh, uh, what question does this raise? It came up this morning, actually. Our, uh, one of our people in the audience raised the question, and, and I didn't want to answer it there because I, I, I know I'm going to address it here. Uh, one of the most fundamental questions our inquiry raises is, should scientific publishers' customary interests be preserved at the expense of scientists' need for wholesale access to and reuse of the exploding universe of published scientific literature and data? And that question immediately raises the ancillary question, what added value uh, does the scientific community obtain from its traditional reliance on external for-profit publishers? Now, how do you explain that in the United States, 120 law journals are published, or more, every year uh, uh, without any published intermediaries? There is a printer, a specialized printer, Christensen. <laughs> he knows how to do it. We don't give him any rights. The rights belong to the journals, and most journals now make them open access. All Duke Law Journals are made open access by uh, our own uh, uh, faculty, uh, Fiat. Uh, so we, uh, we address this problem very deeply in a book uh, that uh, I'm writing with a uh, co-author from Europe, Tom Dieter Werder from Louvain Le Neuf and Paul Euler at the National Academy. Uh, we're writing about uh, global intellectual property strategies for the microbial research commons governing digitally integrated genetic resources, data, and literature. Uh, and that we hope will come out next year on Cambridge. But the basic premise uh, that we put forward there is that science can't rely on these science publishers anymore. It has to contractually create its own research commons for data and literature with its own set of rules. And uh, the first question is, well, do publishers add enough value to justify this uh, situation? And we, we think not. As I say, we managed to publish 120 law review articles with no publisher, no commercial publisher in the middle. 
uh, today, everything is done, it be, it is done with desktop publishing techniques to begin with. Uh, articles are, 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 if you need an editor, you, we, the library will make an editor available. <laughs> um, uh, and if you need a peer review, the peer review we heard this morning is done gratis. <laughs> uh, uh, and so what is it that the publishers are adding here? Uh, much of it, I will just add from an empirical point of view, uh, is that it, it comes from the tradition that the, the journals were farmed out to learned societies, the learned societies farmed them out to publishers, and then they get a part of the royalty so they can have their annual meetings in Florida, have them at the National Academy, and give us back our journals. So um, now, if the public, to the extent that the, the publishers perform a service, the publisher should be paid for that uh, service, but not as copyright owners. Recognizing that publishers must charge for their technical services does not mean we should endow them with exclusive rights to downstream uses or reuses of the scientific product. Yes, pay for the services, not owning the product. Uh, uh, so we think that, in, in fact, all of these restrictions on, on use for the publishers, they just have to be swept away, and how can you do it? Um, uh, well, if you continue to have subscriptions from publishers, uh, then the publishers have to be treated as intermediaries, as uh, Reto Hilti pointed out in his pioneering articles on these, uh, 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 on these subjects. Uh, okay, we can, uh, we can uh, evaluate the value of your services, we can nego negotiate prices, but that doesn't mean that you get uh, the uh, power to control uses and reuse of, uh, reuses of the research. Actually, um, Jorge uh, Contreras, uh, who was, I mentioned the other day at, uh, um, at American University, has come up with an interesting uh, idea. Uh, we haven't evaluated it thoroughly, but he says, well, why don't you give them a one-year license? Okay, now we have embargoes, right? Instead of turning it around, give them a one-year license with all the rights reverting uh, to the scientists, in which case you have the one year. I don't know if they'd recoup enough costs, but uh, at least you wouldn't have this problem. Um, under a, a contractually constructed regime, sci scientists should have the right to make, to do, a, make any research use they can and need of this, uh, 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 of this stuff. Okay, so how do we arrive at this uh, end? Well, funders have an ability to contractually regulate access use and reuse of scientific literature, and I can assure you in the United States they are making more and more uses of it. This, uh, this article and this book was under grants from the NIH. We have to make it available publicly on a repository. And uh, more and more, uh, 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 the, the, the foundations are insisting, and the, N and the NIH and SF are insisting that you deposit a copy uh, before it goes to the publisher on the uh, Public Library of Science, and that has to be freely uh, available. Um, and then, of course, we have the Creative Commons licenses that we have, and we have the move towards open access. Now, uh, uh, I, I have to say, I've heard a number of, 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 of statements recently about how the open access movement is lagging. That's not consistent with our research. Uh, it's growing enormously. In fact, I, I, I have here a figure of 7,500 7, open access journals, and uh, the gentleman from uh, uh, at which university, I'm sorry? Uh, Hamburg, uh, uh, Hanover reminded me that it actually it's up to 8,000 at the moment. So that's growing exponentially. Secondly, these journals are uh, becoming more and more important in quality. We have done empirical research on the microbial uh, um, uh, uh, journals, microbiology journals, we were astounded to find uh, so many of the really good journals are now open access. Springer will allow open access. You, you put it into your grant, you go to them, you give $2,300, they're very happy to do it, and they do even do a better job of editing than, uh, uh, than, than close biology. So uh, the, 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 the constraints on open access are diminishing, and um, uh, more and more people are using it, and I think there is a lot of momentum. Be aware, when, when you're talking about the citation impact of, uh, uh, of uh, open access journals, the, one of the problems is that the agency that uh, evaluates the citation impact only begins five years after the journal is published. So some of the most prestigious new journals where, that are actually founded by leaders in their field are not yet covered by the citation in index, but that will improve as it goes on. And then we think there's something else that's going on that's really important. First of all, 
We think that more and more journals should be integrated back into the universities. We've gone around, we've asked people about, okay, your science departments don't have hundreds of law students who get fantastic training working on our journals, but they do have docs, postdocs, a lot of people working. Uh, uh, they can, with the help of libraries uh, and other internal services, they can produce these journals. And we think the most important initiative potentially is what we call open knowledge environment. What's happening? As I told you, the amounts of data are becoming, uh, uh, you can't, no scientist, can, the genomic scientists, the, the scientists can't handle the data. So p more and more communities are pooling data. In order to pool the data, they have to uh, make all kinds of software and uh, uh, tools to use that data. Uh, and, and then they start publishing uh, because of this stuff. And they can publish their own journal. And that journal can be in one university with the collaboration of five other universities as long as they're all working together. Anyway, these are uh, all ideas that we explore in our book. But, uh, but the, the bottom line is this. We question the customary practices of wholesale reliance on external information brokers in a scientific world where it has become conceptually and technically feasible to link a given thematic community's essential knowledge resources, materials, information, and data into a seamless, digitally integrated network of inputs and outputs that remains open to all contributors to any given research commons or semi-commons, as the case may be. The scientific community, now operating within a hostile intellectual property environment, faces the challenge of organizing and managing these essential knowledge assets with a view to establishing what? A broad upstream research space in which their own contractually imposed rules can apply. Without what? without compromising the possibilities for commercial application of downstream uh, uh, results afterwards. That's where the intellectual property appropriately comes in. When we've got some results, when we've got some commercial applications, when we've got a new gene that will, a, a new gene product that will do something, when we've got a new microbe that will cure cancer, we're not going to get it if we poison the upstream regime with all these blocking uh, exclusive rights. We will get it if we open this regime to our automatic discovery tools and then intelligently apply our patents and our copyrights to downstream outputs. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.